That's it probably fine, yeah. Black pocket, it's green, it's on. It's on, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Please stay. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I guess I have to scream. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. For the recording and streaming, this is perfect. For the room. Yeah. Maybe that's better. Okay, we're starting with the next stop. So Max will be talking about how to how to go from zero to portability. Hello. So um yeah, my name is Max and um, I'm a software engineer at the Beam project and I want to tell you about Beam today and how Beam realized its vision for portability. And um, what do I mean by portability? Because portability can mean a lot of things. Well, first of all, um, you have to listen carefully <laughs> to understand, but hey, Colton. <laughs> uh, but the short answer is that um, it enables you to run your data processing jobs on top of various execution engines like Spark or Flink or Samza or Google Cloud Dataflow. And you can do that in the programming language of your choice. So that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So um, I've put this agenda together. So first of all, I mean, some of you might know Beam, but I'm, uh, I will give a, like a short introduction. Then we will talk about, you know, a bit, little bit more about portability. And um, then how we can actually achieve it, because there are multiple ways to do that. And then we, let's recap and see um, how far we are actually with portability. So what is Beam? So first of all, Beam is an open source project at, at the Apache Software Foundation. So I don't know if you know the pipe, Apache Software Foundation, but it's like a framework for developing open source software, um, which they provide infrastructure and kind of a guide how to develop software in the open source. And uh, Beam is a project there, and it, it focuses on parallel and distributed data processing. So um, you typically run your Beam job on like multiple machines, um, and you have probably la you have mostly large data, but you can also run it on a single machine if you want. And um, it has a really cool API which can do batch and stream processing at the same time. So often, like you have like a batch and stream API which are separate, and you have to like port your uh, batch job to streaming. But in Beam, it's all the same. Um, so and and once you've written your job, you can actually run it on like multiple executions engines. That's why sometimes we say it's like an Uber API because like, you use one API, but you can execute with multiple uh, backends or execution engines. And now or you can also use your favorite programming language. Um, so a little bit more detail on this. So we have, I mean, this is the vision of Beam. We have um, the SDKs here on the left side. And so that's like Java, Go, Python, Scala, and SQL. And then we have some magic happening in Beam, which are the runners. There's a runner for every execution backend. And the runner translates um, the Beam job in the SDK into the language of the execution engine. And um, you, you can see there are a bunch of them. And more and more are coming. And yeah, I mean, that's really nice to have that choice, right? So how does the API work, like just concept-wise? So in Beam, they are, they are called, um, there are P collections. So the first of all, there, there's the pipeline. The pipeline is like the, the object that holds all your job information. So you create that from some options which you can pass in there. And then you um, create P collections. P collections are created by applying transforms to the pipeline. So you do always like apply transforms. So it's really easy. And this can be like, um, you can do multiple transforms after each other, or you can do, you can also branch like here where you um, create this p call two, which is like you know a branch of p call one. Um, so and then you can you can run that and uh, that pipeline. That's pretty sweet. So transforms are actually quite a nice abstraction because um, transforms can be either primitive or composite. What does it mean? Actually, in Beam, we only have a few primitive transforms. We only have like pardo, group by key, assign windows, and flatten. So 
I will explain two of them in a bit, but um, so basically what that means, you can define like composer transforms which use these, and then um, these are actually the composer transforms I ex expanded to these primitive ones, which is really easy because we just need to, I mean as a runner creator, um, you just need to implement those for primitive transforms and we can, we can do optimizations for composer transforms, but it's enough to implement that primitive transform. So of course, because this is like a big data framework, we have to do uh, a little word count. And um, for those of you who don't know word count, it's basically you're trying to, you have a list of words like to be or not to be, and you try to count how often is, like a unique word, distinct word appears in that list. The way to do that is to use, if we are talking about beam, then you use a par do, which stands for parallel do, and you would, you would assign like a key value, you would transform your words into a key value object with like a one, which stands for number of occurrences. And then you would do a group by key, which basically, um, well, shuffles the data and um, gives you a list of all the values for uh, every distinct key. And then you can sum them up and you know that two is twice in this list and B also and the others just once. Um, so don't, don't get confused now. This, is, this looks really ugly. Um, this is actually how you would do it in Beam, but we will see we can simplify it a lot. So we, we have um, the pipeline. We, create a, we have our list of words, in this case, like hello, hello, Fostem, and we, we have this pardo, this first one, which assigns like the one, um, and then we do a group by key, and then we have this loop here in the second part which sums it all up. Yeah, I mean, that was pretty ugly. Um, I agree. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know a better way to write this uh, any non-comprehensible. Um, so luckily, we have composite transforms. So um, we, we can simplify this now further. So instead of doing the, the first part which where, where we do this um, do with n function, we just use a map elements function, which is slightly sim uh, more simple, and we do a, like an integers per key composer transforms, but which does basically it sums up the value, uh, the number of occurrences for each key, and we can simplify this even further by um, by just using this count per element composer transform. So that looks pretty simple, right? So um, there are a lot of these uh, transforms in Beam, and um, if you read the documentation, you can, you can write really readable code, even in Java, because that is, that is a Java API. Um, we have, of course, fortunately, also a Python API, which, which looks so much nicer. So here, this would be the same um, initial example. We just use Lumber functions um, to that, do that work count. And um, also in Python, we have, of course, these composite transforms. So this is maybe slightly simpler where we have the combined per key function and we pass sum, sum, sum as an argument. This is just a, like a very quick look into the Beam API. I thought it would be useful. There's lots of more um, composer transforms. You can create your own. We have lots of I.O. We have windowing, event time, watermark, site inputs, I mean, state and timers, which is, it doesn't make sense to you at the moment maybe if you haven't tried it, but um, it's really useful concept once you um, learn more about Beam and your pipeline gets more complicated. Um, so what does portability mean now? I mean, I showed you Java, I showed you Python. Uh, where does, I mean, it sh I mean, that should already be working, right? So let's see first, what is, I mean, what are the two different kinds of portability in, in the Beam context? So we have the engine portability, which is like the ability to run it on uh, different execution engines. And we have the language portability, which is like using different SDKs for composing uh, the, the pipeline. And if we look back at the vision, which I showed you at the beginning, this is really, I mean, how it should work, right? And um, in terms of engine portability, it is actually true. Like, if we are in the Java API, we, we just, you know, these options would we pass to the pipeline, we just set runner, flink runner, and then we do run, and it really runs on Flink. That's pretty amazing. So we have that part covered already. Um, now what about language portability? Um, why would we use other languages? Well, it's kind of, I mean, clear, I guess. Um, syntax expression of communities is a big point because there are a lot of people who simply don't like Java for various reasons. 
which I can understand. I mean, I really like Java, but it's okay. But we also have um, a lot of libraries, which is like an important factor. Like TensorFlow are really like huge libraries, which are simply not available in in, in Java. Mm. So that's a good reason to use Python. So I was actually lying a bit to you. Um, this whole <laughs> This whole portability, language-wise, doesn't really or didn't really work. So it it used to be the case that we just, I mean, basically only were supporting Java and Scala in in the open source world. And we had like um, when you used like the Google Cloud, you could run Python, which is like not so cool, <laughs> right? I mean, it kind of breaks the promise. So what we what we need is. And what we worked on in the past, like oof, almost two years, is um, to build a language portability framework into Beam and its runners, so that we actually can do the the full realize the full vision. Um, so, how do we achieve how do we achieve it? If we look at um, sort of the very abstract translation process of a pipeline. It used to be like this, where we had Java um, and then a bunch of runners, and they all executed in Java, so they need to implement their own translation way, but once they translated, it was fine. Now that we um, have language portability, it seems like a, a, well, maybe not very good idea, but it's certainly possible to just, you know, let every SDK figure out a way to translate um, to every execution engine. Then the execution engine has like various, their own various ways of supporting that language. But this, that just seems like a terrible idea, very complicated and replicating a lot of work. So what, what we did is um, we introduced the, the runner API, which takes the pipeline from the SDK and sort of transforms it into a language agnostic format. It's called the Runner API. So it's it's based on protobuf. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just like a, a format that is consistent across languages. So, and then what we also needed is during execution, we have like these language dependent parts. Like when the execution engines, all, most of them are, actually all of them are written in Java. So uh, when you have Python, you need to figure out a way to um, send data to, to that Python process and uh, access state and on all that. and this is called um, the FUN API, FN API, yeah. And that way we pretty much only have these two extra layers and um, just have to make sure the runners are compatible with that and then we're good to go. So let me simplify this a lot. So we have the, it, the old way was like we have the SDK and the runner. And we have, for example, an uh, um, execution engine like Flink with a bunch of tasks. And the, all these were in Java. So, and that worked pretty well. Uh, the new way is a bit different. So in the new way, we have the SDK here, which uh, uses the runner API to produce this universal uh, pipeline format. And then we actually have um, the job API, which is a way to um, send this pipeline to the job server, and the job server is really a beam concept now. It used to be that every runner had, you know, ex every execution engine had its own way of submitting applications, and but we wanted to, you know, really um, get everything portable. So we created the job server, and in the job server, the runner translates um, this runner API um, pipeline, and then um, it executes it on the engine of your choice. But of course, we have these like. Uh, Python blobs or Go blobs in between, which we don't really understand. And whenever we have that, we, we, we have a special well, task called executable stage, which is a fancy name for we don't know what to do with this, so we have to send it to an external process, which is called the SDK harness. And that harness exists for every language, like for Java, Python, and Go. So um, whenever so whenever we, I mean, so we, we put the, we create the harness when we start the job with the Python code, for instance, and then when, whenever we um, receive data in that um, task, we, we send that to the external process. The external process does its processing and sends that back, you know? It's very simplified. And 
there's, there's some challenges to that because there is not a great cost, but there's some costs when you send data to an external process, right? Because you need to serialize that data and deserialize it again. So we build in some optimization called Fusion, which tries to combine as many of these um, Python stages, for instance, into um, one SDK harness. So we um, don't do any like the duplicate serialization work. How does the SDK harness work? So um, first of all, the SDK harness needs to be bootstrapped somehow, right? Um, so what we typically do is we use Docker. So we have an environment which contains all the dependencies like my TensorFlow or my NumPy and, and just use this Docker image directly. We can specify that in the options. That's a really easy way of deploying because you, you have an image registry and you just download that image automatically and start it. But some people don't want to use Docker because um, for various reasons. <laughs> and so you can also start like a process-based execution, but then you have to make sure you set up the environment, thank you, the environment like manually. And um, it's also possible to run this embedded in case you are, you are using Java. And um, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of happening, a lot of communication between like the backend and the SDK harness. Like obviously we need to control, like we have like control plane, a data plane, we have a way to access state and, and re re report progress and also logging. I mean, everything is locked so you, you know actually what is, what is happening inside that external process because otherwise debugging it would be, would be really hard. So what is now missing is and kind of a problem, it is not only, I mean, a runner is, is um, like a SDK is only complete if you can read and write data, right? Because um, it's not really worth anything if we can support all the primitive transforms. We also have to be able to um, actually have that connectors which we have in Java in, in any um, SDK available. And you can see there are a lot of them available. Now it would be kind of a lot of work to replicate them and the, the language support, um, for example, when you cr want to create a Kafka connector in Python, the language support is not so good. In Java it's really good. So ideally we would, we would just use the Java connector in Python and um, not recreate it in, uh, in Python. And turns out we can actually do that and that's a pretty amazing solution. We can simply use that process which I described to run cr cross-language pipelines. So how does it work theoretically? I mean we're finalizing like the specification at the moment but it's sort of like this. So you have a Python job and I mean probably it's not going to be named IO expansion but it's kind of like a, like a dummy object where you specify your IO like Kafka IO or maybe the full Java name. I mean it, that, it will be made a bit simpler and you pass some configuration and then, of course, I mean, Python doesn't understand this, but when we do the translation to the runner API, we actually have like an expansion service, a Java expansion service running, if we want to, uh, in the case of, of Java. And we, so we take that stub, this placeholder, and expand it into like a, like a native Java um, Kafka transform. So, um, and then, when, then we do the rest of the translation, and during, during, when the job runs, we actually have now two different kind of SDK harness running. So we have a Java one for our Kafka source, and then we have um, maybe some Python data processing afterwards where we do some map and count, and we of course also have the native, trans, like native Flink or whatever you're using uh, execution engine transform like a group by key which, which just doesn't need uh, an SDK harness or anything because it's uh, supported by the execution engine. Yeah, so this is sort of how portability works. There are a lot of details, of course, but it's a 20 minutes talk. Um, so um, how, how far are we? So we have the engine portability, mm -hmm. and we have um, the language portability. Um, almost, I would say. I mean, for developers, you can try it out yourself. I um, have a link for you in the end. You can try it out, it works. Um, we just have to make it a bit better you know, there are some, some, like we have to tune a bit of performance, although we have estimated 5 to 10% only overhead in, in most cases. 
And then of course language pipeline support needs a bit more end specification, but that's gonna happen in the next weeks. There's also this fancy thing called splittable DoFN, which you can read up, but um, that's not so important. There's a comp compatibility matrix, which tracks like the, the, the status um, for portability of all runners. There's a link here, and Flink actually is like the, the best runner, I would say, because it, it supports most features at the moment. Um, the others are gonna catch up. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, Please um, check out the portability website or just go to the normal Beam website if you want to learn more about Beam. We have mailing lists and an awesome Slack channel which is uh, where, where there are a lot of helpful people. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Compile to what? Sorry. Uh, common bytecode. Common bytecode. Um, yeah, so the question is why not use something like Apache Tinker, Tinkerpop, which uses like an intermediate, common intermediate format between the languages, and then, or which is like bytecode, which can then be executed. Um, there are a lot of other uh, frameworks which do that. For example, Flink has a Python API which uses Python, which is sort of like the same idea. You can generate bytecode from Python. We want to be able to support all kinds of libraries like um, TensorFlow, which is like a native C library. And that you can only achieve if you run like a C Python interpreter and not like some custom version of Python which only supports a subset of Python. That's the reason. I have, um, so yeah, I repeat the question. So how is the debugging experience like in these um, uh, Python libraries? When, when you run into an error in Python, like how fast do you see it and you, when you execute on a, on a, well, essentially Java runtime? Uh, it's actually pretty good and it's been part of the design. So when, when in Python you see an exception, it will be like forwarded directly to, um, to the, to the op, like Java operator and it will, catch an error there and so and you, you due to the logging and stuff like that you actually see immediately um, what ca and the error is also sent back so, so you see the error message immediately there and your pipeline will fail because if the runner receives a failure it should fail <laughs> yeah huh. good question uh, I'm not working on the yeah so the Python 3, is it supported or not? Uh, it is supported, but it is like 99% done. So it, it is there, you can use it. There are test cases and everything. It's just not you know, officially been released because I'm not working on, on the Python site myself, so um, I'm, I expect it to be done actually in the 2.11 release, which is the next Beam release. Should be out next month, yeah. Thank you.